Welcome and thank you for joining me in this educational presentation on transischemic acid, or what I like to call mash in a bottle. Transischemic acid, or TXA, is an old drug, well documented in the literature, the cardiothoracic world, the orthopedic world, and the gynecological world. It's only until recently that we start to see TXA hit the trauma literature, and subsequently the EMS literature. So sit back, enjoy, and let's get started. So our objectives, we are going to start with reviewing the hemostasis in the trauma patient. We'll talk about the balance between coagulation versus fibrolysis. We'll then take a look at the TXA pathophysiology. And then we'll look at TXA and how it affects the trauma patient in the two pivotal studies, uh, which include the CRASH-2 trial as well as the MATTER study. And then we'll look how this is all put together into a protocol and review Medivac's protocol for both the air and ground side. So we know that millions of patients will bleed to death after trauma each year. Many of the patients will survive to reach the hospital, but despite the best hospital resuscitation, trauma efforts, trauma surgery, those patients will pass. As you see at the bottom, the pie chart represents the causes of inpatient in-hospital deaths. On the right, you can see CNS injuries, about 41%. Um, we'll talk about where TXA actually may help lower that uh, somewhat. 10% uh, is organ failure, and quite often that's because of under resuscitation, um, hypovolemia, and those first, you know, critical platinum 10 minutes in the golden hour, which leads to end organ failure. 4% is in the other, and then about almost half of the patients, 45%, uh, from bleeding out itself. And it's this area that we're going to focus on when we talk about TXA. So hemostasis really is a balance of coagulation and fibrolysis. If there's an injury, you have this whole cascade here, as you can see on the diagram on the left, of all these factors that combined essentially make prothrombin and thrombin, uh, and then converting fibrinogen into fibrin to help kind of bind with the platelets to make this fibrin clot. And on the other side of the house is fibrinolysis. Uh, plasminogen activators activate plasminogen into plasmin, which then helps break down that clot. So in a bleeding trauma patient, you know, in, in, when there's an injury to a blood vessel, coagulation starts. The whole idea is to develop this fibrin clot with platelets, blood cells, fibrin all together to kind of plug up that injured vessel. At the same time, fibrinolysis is occurring so that we don't get overdevelopment of that clot in that blood vessel, therefore then uh, completely clogging off that blood vessel. So it's a fine balance. But if there are serious bleeding, especially in a trauma patient, um, a lot of those coagulation factors get all used up, uh, and over time you see, start to see more fibrinolysis than you do coagulation. So that balance is tipped in the way of fibrinolysis, and obviously if we're breaking down more and more clot, uh, that bleeding is going to get worse. So look, taking a look at coagulation first, uh, there are essentially three steps that occur to create the clot, uh, the plasma uh, platelet fibrin clot. First, we see that blood vessels will constrict, and they try to constrict to close off that injured uh, vessel as best they can. Then we start to see uh, second platelet plug forms. Third, all the clotting cascading is activated, uh, finally ending up with the platelet and fibrin clot. So we'll look at those a little bit closer. So step one, uh, blood vessel constriction. And you can see at the site of injury, you get this reflexive raise or constriction of that vessel to try to seal out that that hole uh, as best it can. At the same time, those injured cells on either side of that injury start to release endothelin. That endothelin then further causes vasoconstriction to kind of seal off that vessel. In this picture, you can see where all that constriction and all these collagen fibers then come together. And we'll see in the next step that that's important. Uh, the factors released from those collagen fibers, you can start to see uh, the platelets, uh, blood cells, uh, as they all kind of get um, activated to come to this area of injury. So step two, platelet plug formation. As you can see in step, step one, uh, platelets are activated um, by those collagen fibers as they're exposed to create inactive to active platelets. And you see they all start to stick at that site of injury. At the same time, they release ADP. Adis adenosine diphosphate, which then further activates circulating platelets um, to become activated uh, and then join in that platelet plug. Um, newly activated platelets um, aggregate, they continue to grow, 
at that site of injury. Um, they cause more chemicals to attract uh, as much of the, the uh, platelets as they can uh, to create that uh, hole. At the same time, normal endothelium will release prostacyclin and nitric acid, um, which helps kind of keep those inactive platelets inactive so that they don't seal to the, the normal endothelium, but again, are ready and available to attract at the injury site. Step three, uh, the clotting cascade. There are many factors involved. Uh, typically, we'll talk about 12 factors, uh, factors 1 through 12, uh, which include protein C, protein S, thrombin, prothrombin, von Willebrand factor, calcium, uh, as well as vitamin K. There are three pathways uh, that we talk about. We talk about the extrinsic pathway, which is triggered by trauma, um, trauma to the vessel. We also talk about the intrinsic pathway, which is triggered by internal damage of the vessel wall. Those both lead into the common pathway, which is merger of those two pathways to cause the final clotting. If you remember, with clotting factors, uh, many of them are made in the liver. So it's very important that you have an intact liver uh, and no subsequent pathology of the liver to continue to create clotting factors. So think about that when you have a patient that has cirrhosis, uh, whether it's from alcohol, uh, infectious process, and has uh, trauma on top of that, that patient's going to bleed a lot more than uh, your normal trauma patient because they're missing a lot of those factors. Here's those pathways that we talk about. Uh, the intrinsic pathway or you know, damage to the surface of the blood vessel uh, enacts all of these factors. Okay? And the extrinsic pathway factor or a pathway that we talk about, uh, the tissue factor, so injury to the blood vessel itself you know, from trauma, uh, activating uh, factors, all leading to prothrombin to thrombin, fibrinogen to fibrin, and then fibrin kind of cross-linking with the platelets, uh, blood vessels into that clot. Another pictorial of that clotting cascade, you can see all the factors, um, tissue factors uh, that are involved, essentially prothrombin to thrombin, um, that we uh, convert fibrinogen to fibrin as it all creates this fibrin clot. At the same time, on the opposite side, and we'll talk about that in a minute, you, talk about, you see uh, plasminogen that's converted to plasma. It helps blur break down that clot, create these fibrin uh, split products or degradation products. Uh, typically, this is where we measure that D-dimer. Microscopic uh, view on a scanning electron microscope. You can see this nice fibrin clot, uh, blood vessels, platelets together with all this fibrin mesh network uh, at the site of injury. So on the flip side, we'll talk about fibrinolysis. Um, plasminogen activators, TPA or tissue plasminogen activator, for instance, uh, from an injured blood vessel converts plasminogen to plasmin, which then helps break down that fibrin clot. And you see these fibrin degradation products. You'll notice this little binding site here, this lysine binding site. And this is going to be an important uh, piece uh, when we talk about TXA. So again, just another review. Uh, pictorial, you see the plasminogen from tissue plax, uh, plasminin activator creating plasmin, which then helps break down that fibrin clot. So how do we limit fibrinolysis, coagulopathy in a trauma patient? Um, typically, uh, in standard first line is blood products. Um, many transfusion protocols, massive transfusion protocols um, using uh, blood, plasma, um, fresh frozen plasma platelets um, to help kind of replace a lot of the clotting factors that are, that are missing. Um, second, uh, and, and somewhat relatively new, are these prothrombin complex concentrates, or PCCs. Um, very expensive, somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,000 to $1,200 um, to help replace a lot of the prothrombin. Again, that last bit of clotting cascade creating uh, fibrinogen to fibrin. You also can replace vitamin K. Uh, often we do this with uh, Coumadin patients that are coagulopathic, uh, replacing K, as Coumadin is a vitamin K dependent factor. Other things we can do is replace factors themselves. Um, many of these are recombinant, um, so uh, they're very expensive. Um, we talk about patients with hemophilia, 
uh, hemophilia A, hemophilia B. Many of these patients will carry the factor with them. So if they have a traumatic injury, uh, even as simple as a bump on the head uh, they present to the ER, they often bring their factor with them. Uh, these factors are expensive. They're hard, harder to store. Uh, in the trauma world, uh, factor 7 is one that we were using quite a bit. Uh, but again, almost $1,500 a dose. Um, and the literature is plus or minus whether it was as helpful as we initially thought. So typically we don't see that uh, too much often anymore. And then there's TXA, uh, and which obviously is the, top, the, uh, the topic of our talk here today. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit later. So looking at transfusion products um, pro is our primary resuscitation approach to minimize trauma-induced coagulopathy. Um, we're talking about, about mass transfusion protocols, and um, uh, many of which will include mass transfusion as uh, greater than 10 units. Um, often, uh, if we have a patient that's pretty hypotensive, has a significant uh, traumatic injury uh, where they're quote-unquote bleeding out, um, you'll see a, a ratio of 1 to 1 to 1, or 6 packed red blood cells to 6 uh, units of fresh frozen plasma uh, to 6 pack of platelets. Um, so this 1 to 1 to 1 type ratio. And that may be repeated if the patient continues to be hypotensive, uh, continues to bleed. Fresh frozen plasma uh, is indicated when there's a, a multi factor deficiency associated with severe bleeding uh, and or our DIC patients, um, patients that uh, become very hypercoagulable uh, after trauma uh, where a lot of their factors are, are used up. You'll start to see them go into DIC, uh, so they'll bleed out. You'll see DIC with uh, severe sepsis, um, sometimes after birth uh, and uh, birth associated DIC. Cryoprecipitate uh, is another uh, transfusion product that we can use. Often uh, used when plasma fibrinogen level is less than one gram per liter. Uh, often this is uh, part of our mass transfusion type protocols as well. Again, we talked about the activated prothrombin complex concentrate. Um, again, very expensive. Uh, but there is some good uh, research go ongoing uh, and some promising data, uh, especially on the new drugs like Xeralta, Eliquis and Perdaxa, of which we, there are no measurable levels, and we're not sure exactly how they work and how is the uh, best way to reverse them. Um, so these PCCs have had some promising uh, looks on that. Some of the literature has shown that uh, in combination with TXA um, with the PCCs uh, has been very promising, um, and there's some more ongoing studies on that right now. Um, the activated factors we talked about, um, that's recombinant factor 7, uh, which is what we've used uh, in the trauma literature uh, back when even I was a resident, you know, eight years ago was pretty common. Uh, vitamin K, uh, which is very uh, important, uh, increases factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, as well as protein C and protein S. And vitamin K is relatively uh, inexpensive. Here's a list of all the factors that you can replace. Um, the uh, factors on the left uh, and the deficiencies on the right. Um, you can see down towards uh, here, you have the hemophilia A, which is a factor 8 deficiency, as well as hemophilia B, factor 9 deficiency. Um, so you may see those uh, every once in a while. So let's talk about TXA. Um, so TXA reduces fibrolysis. Um, I think of it as the anti-TPA. It is a synthetic derivative of lysine, and you see that it binds at that lysine uh, binding site that we talked about earlier. Therefore, when t the TPA binds with plasminogen, that is not able to be uh, attached to the fibrin, so when it's converted to plasmin from the TPA, uh, it will not bind to the fibrin uh, product at this point, and so you won't get any breakdown. So that's essentially why I call it the anti-TPA. So putting them together you can see on the left fibrolysis of the TPA combines with plasminogen uh, which becomes plasmin, attaches to the fibrin product uh, and then splits it down and you get these fibrin degradation products. Whereas the TA, TXA binds to that plasminogen uh, at that lysine binding site. Um, so when TPA converts to plasmin won't connect to the the fibrin so you get no breakdown of the fibrin clot. So we'll look at some of the pharmacokinetics 
Um, so TXA, the absorption is usually within 5 to 15 minutes. Uh, and duration is about 3 hours. And that 3 hour mark you'll see again when we talk about the literature uh, as an important part. Uh, typically it's distributed, uh, distributed on the protein uh, of plasminogen. So it's protein bound about 3%, uh, mostly to, to plasminogen. Metabolism, metabolism uh, only about a small amount of the drug is metabolized, about 5%. Um, so really not a whole lot uh, that is actually used and metabolized. Uh, Half-life is about 2 to 11 hours. Uh, it is predominantly excreted in the urine and about 95% unchanged. Um, so one can think, you know, if I have a patient that has some renal deficiency, uh, renal failure, uh, they're an end-stage renal uh, patient on dialysis, um, will the TXA be increased? Um, if you look at the literature, it's kind of plus or minus. Um, in theory, you might get a little bit more of the drug hanging around, uh, but typically not because of, you know a small percentage of it is metabolized. So again, about three percent of it is bound to uh, fibrinogen. I'm sorry, to uh, plasminogen. Uh, it does not bind to the protein in the blood, uh, such as albumin. Um, it will cross the blood-brain barrier, which can be an a potential. Uh, important uh, benefit to TBI patients, and we'll talk about that in the literature uh, as we get here a little bit further. Interesting, uh, in patients with hereditary hemangioedema, um, these are patients that uh, are not on ACE inhibitors um, but have a complement deficiency um, that causes a swelling of the tongue, swelling of the li lips, um, you actually sometimes see patients where they get swelling in the intestines, uh, they get a lot of nausea, vomiting, and belly pain. Um, we know that um, we inactivate uh, and decrease the activity of plasmin with TXA, so this may actually help prevent attacks of angioedema by decreasing the plasmin-induced activation of the first complement protein, or C1. Um, often with the hereditary angioedema patients, we give them C1 or a complement. Uh, again, another very expensive um, replacement, uh, but TXA may have a benefit in this role, kind of a, on a side note. Typically, our dosing is 1 gram over 10 minutes, and then a maintenance infusion of 1 gram in 1,000 cc's over about 8 hours. The nice thing about TXA is it really can be mixed in uh, many of the available solutions, so saline, lactate. Uh, even uh, dextrose containing fluids. It can't be given in the same IV as blood or uh, recombinant factor 7. For obvious reasons, uh, the TXA will bind and coagulate the blood. Uh, so you want to kind of avoid that. Make sure that they're going in, in uh, two different lines. Cannot also be given with IV uh, penicillin, so be careful in your uh, septic patients as well. Uh, the nice thing about TXA is that it can be stored uh, in relatively um, common environments, so you know a temperature of 56 to 86 degrees, uh, which fits most of the aircraft uh, and ground ambulances, so it's relatively stable. So indications, uh, useful for a wide range of hemorrhage. Um, there are large operating room studies that de demonstrated reduced blood loss. Um, the CT surgery world, uh, those patients you know, that may have been or may not have been on bypass, uh, significant benefit. Um, in the orthopedic world, uh, for uh, mostly joint replacements, uh, hip, total knees, uh, you'll see that. I know our orthopedic surgeons are using it, especially for patients when they're replacing uh, hips or knees that are very oozy. And they will give uh, TXA to help kind of decrease that. Uh, in the GU world, uh, prostatectomies, which are typically uh, a pretty bloody surgery, um, there's a lot of pelvic vasculature. TXA is helpful to keep that a little bit uh, drier. In the gynecological world, same thing. A lot of pelvic vasculature, uh, which can be relatively, you know, blood sur bloody surgeries as well. The TXA is helpful. You also see uh, TXA, and I, I've used uh, in the literature will show in nosebleeds, patients on Coumadin, um, patients on other blood thinners, um, using it for uh, packing of nosebleeds um, to help reduce them. Uh, in the dental literature for uh, hemorrhage after uh, tooth extraction, um, uh, TXA has been helpful. Uh, tr traditionally, we've used tea bags in those uh, to help reduce the bleeding at the gum. Uh, TXA has actually been very helpful, and I've used it several times. Um, you'll see it in the gyne gynecological world as well for patients um, for have dysfunctional uterine bleeding or heavy mens uh, menses. 
you have a patient that will start taking it uh, in a tablet form uh, during their menses to help kind of decrease uh, the bleeding. So what about the trauma world? Uh, we'll definitely stay tuned and we'll talk about uh, some of the literature in a second. So we know that transischemic acid reduces the surgical bleeding. Uh, and if you look at this graph on the right, uh, you can see that TXA is definitely better for reducing the need for blood transfusions for about by about one third. So that's a pretty significant decrease. So some of the contraindications acquired defective color vision. Um, this is uh, often caused by medications, uh, other reactions. Um, if you know that has a patient has that, often that's you know, a little bit hard to, to determine. Um, I start subarachnoid hemorrhage here uh, because right now not necessarily indicated for uh, cerebral bleed, uh, but there is ongoing literature and we'll talk about that. But right now, uh, isolated head, injury, head injuries is a contraindication. If a patient has known active intravascular clotting, so um, they have a DVT history, they have a P history, they have um, other clotting disorders, uh, it's typically uh, contraindicated. And then obviously a hypersensitivity TXA if they're allergic to it. Some of the side effects, uh, GI disturbances, uh, typically these are dose related. Uh, you can see nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, other visual disturbances, blurry vision, color perception, um, especially in prolonged use. And you see this more in the patients that are taking in the tablet form, you know, over a long period of time. Typically in the IV bolus and stuff, uh, in the trauma world that we're seeing it, uh, it's a lot less uh, pronounced. Um, Thrombotic events uh, are definitely a, a potential side effect, uh, PE, uh, DVT, and we'll talk about that in the literature. Neurologic uh, side effects. Uh, seizures is one thing that we have to worry about, um, and that's due to inactivation of glycine-mediated circuits, uh, which are typically inhib inhibitory networks, uh, very similar to GABA. Um, GABA, when stimulated, helps kind of decrease the activity of the neurons. Um, typically, that's how Ativan works. It uh, you know, mediates the GABA receptors, which then helps slow things down. But if you look at what helps control seizures uh, with TXA use, um, some of the literature points towards using propofol um, as a first-line agent to reduce the uh, TXA-induced seizures. Uh, so keep that in mind if you have a patient with that. Other things, dizziness, fatigue, headache, um, often I think is listed on every medication out there, uh, as well as nausea and vomiting, um, but you can see those a little bit more common than, than normal. And hypersensitivity reaction, uh, very similar to other allergy um, type reactions that you've seen in the past, um, hives, swelling, um, things of that nature, of which you're going to treat the same way. So if we look at the, the Jehovah's Witness, uh, they do have an approved list. As we know, blood products are, are not on their list. Uh, but this is a safe list, DDAVP, uh, Amicar, which is very similar to TXA, kind of works on a similar process. Um, see, TXA is an approved uh, medication. Vasopressin, uh, vincristine, um, vitamin K, uh, estrogens that are conjugated. Uh, and recombinant factors, all of which, because they are uh, recombinant, um, they're not made from blood, fact, uh, blood products. Um, so a lot of the factors uh, are okay and on the list. So what do we know so far? Well, we know that TXA reduces clot breakdown. We know that TXA reduces bleeding in, in the surgical world. And we know that many patients die of bleeding and trauma. So we have to ask ourselves, will TXA reduce death and bleeding trauma patients? Well, we'll turn to the literature. Um, we're going to look at the two landmark studies, the CRASH-2 study, uh, which stands for the Clinical Randomization of an Antifibrinolytic in Significant Hemorrhage. And we'll look at a military study, uh, the MATTER study, the Military Application of Transischemic Acid and Trauma Emergency Resuscitation Study. So the CRASH-2 uh, hit the literature in the Lancet 2010, the effects of transischemic acid on death, vascular occlusive events, and blood transfusion in trauma patients with significant hemorrhage. The nice thing is this is a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study. And uh, if you remember from looking at your literature world, uh, these are the best type studies, uh, the most effective and the most powerful. So this is a pretty good study. CRASH-2 used over 20,000 bleeding trauma patients. Uh, they were randomly split into the TXA arm uh, or the placebo arm. And all adult patients uh, who were within eight hours of their injury were included. 
uh, if their doctor thought they had a, or could have a significant hemorrhage. This was the protocol, um, very much uh, loading one gram over 10 minutes, um, whether it was a slow IV push or in a small 100-200cc uh, bag infusion over 10 minutes, followed by a maintenance infusion of one gram over eight hours. So just as the manufacturer states, uh, one gram uh, immediately over 10 minutes, followed by one gram over the next eight hours as an infusion. So 20,211 patients in 274 hospitals in 40 countries. Now if you look at the flags below, notice that the American flag is not there. And the reason for that is the FDA would not sign off on the study. Uh, they did not uh, believe that it was significant enough and they didn't want to be included. So the U.S. was kept out. Um, newer literature, you'll see that we actually are playing uh, along and included in it. But nonetheless, a uh, pretty large study, a um, lot of hospitals involved, a lot of countries involved. This is a map um, of all the countries that were involved on four continents. And you can see just to the south of us, Mexico, and the north of us, Canada, uh, were included on the study. Um, and of course, you can see across all of Europe, uh, Australia, um, parts of South America, and Africa. So 20,211 randomized patients. Uh, I see 10,096 of them in the TXA arm and 10,115 in the placebo arm. Uh, only three consents were withdrawn in the TXA arm and one in the placebo arm, uh, which is pretty significant. Um, so you can see the baseline. 33 were lost to follow-up on the TXA arm and only 47 uh, on the uh, placebo arm, which is pretty significant uh, in a study this large. To only lose a few patients uh, on each arm is, is pretty significant uh, and pretty amazing. So you can see numbers are pretty similar, 10,060 patients versus 10,067 uh, in the placebo arm. So they were trying to measure as their primary outcomes the in-hospital mortality within four weeks of injury, and they were also looking at vasoclusive events, so DVT, PE. So they wanted to see how many of these patients, uh, what their mortality was within the first four weeks, uh, and then see how many of them had a DVT or PE. Some of their secondary outcomes is they wanted to see how many of those patients you know, required transfusions uh, and how many of them required surgical interventions. Some of the subgroup analysis, uh, kind of diving deeper into the data, they looked at demographics and compared them between each arm, uh, age of the patients between each arm, their hours post-injury, uh, which is going to be important uh, when we talk about dosing and timing, uh, type of injury, so looking at injury severities, um, blood pressures, uh, and then GCSs. So if you look at some of the demographics uh, in the arms, the male uh, numbers are about the same as the placebo uh, and TXA. The female and pl uh, TXA and placebo arms are about the same. Uh, ages are all about the same, uh, less than 25 to 25 to 34, 35 to 44, and over 44. So all pretty similar um, gender and age demographics. Time of injury, uh, also about the same. So less than an hour is one of the periods they looked at. The next period they looked at greater than but less than or equal to three hours and then over three hours. Again, that three hour mark, if you remember, um, is going to be important. And then they look at the type of injury, blunt injury versus penetrating injury. And you can see that the numbers are relatively the same in all of those uh, trauma factors. Looking at severity scores, uh, blood pressures uh, greater than 89 systolic, 76 to 89 systolic, and then less than 75 systolic. And the numbers are just about uh, the same as well. Looking at GCFs, uh, severe versus moderate and mild, again, the numbers are, are relatively similar. So pretty interesting. Uh, of 20,000 patients in both arms, uh, the demographics, uh, the trauma, factors and the uh, injury severity scores are all about the same. So let's look at some of the results. So under cause of death, uh, bleeding, you can see under the TXA, 489 patients versus 573. Uh, thrombosis, organ failure, head injury, and other, and then any death. So about 1400 versus 1600 
uh, deaths in the TXA versus the placebo arms, uh, which pretty significant p-values. So meaning that uh, these are pretty significant results. So looking at just the benefit uh, for bleeding deaths, um, and that's where most of the benefit came from, uh, you can see that um, TXA uh, was significant better, 4.9% versus the placebo of 5.7%, uh, and that is statistically significant. Looking at the uh, time of injury, it does show that the earlier TXA is given, the better. So less than an hour, uh, the best, you know, an hour to three hours, uh, still pretty good. Um, but once you get to the over three hour period, uh, significantly uh, less effect uh, than placebo. So for all bleeding patients is where we sat um, from the last slide. So the faster we give it, after the onset of injury, uh, the better the patients do. And we'll talk about why that might be at this three hour mark. So we know that bleeding deaths occur relatively soon after the injury. And that corresponds again, you know, the same as here. And you can see uh, deaths due to bleeding more so in the first couple out, um, hours to days. And um, corresponding with the deaths of, of others. So looking at the subgroup analysis, um, again, looking at time of injury, um, systolic blood pressures, GCSs, type of injury, uh, and all deaths, you can see uh, overall uh, the benefit of TXA, okay, when we're on the other side of one, versus um, TXA being worse. So pretty much all of those factors in that subgroup analysis that we looked at, TXA was pretty significantly uh, better um, except for, as you can see again, over that three hour mark. Interesting enough, this uh, mid systolic blood pressure almost equal, uh, which is kind of an interesting um, variant uh, of the data. So, looking at th uh, thrombotic events, there really was no increase in thrombosis versus TXA versus the placebo. You'll see DVT um, slightly better with TXA. Um, PE relatively similar, um, not really significantly different at all. MI was less uh, in the TXA group. Um, one can theorize it from pulling out from the data that might be that these patients, if they had some underlying ischemia, uh, were not losing blood, were not hypotensive, were not hypovolemic, so therefore, you know, continue to perfuse their myocardium. Um, so it might be one benefit as to why the TXA arm was better. Uh, very similar in the stroke as well. Um, so overall, uh, any was pretty significantly better with TXA. So really, there was no increase in thrombosis as uh, initially was a concern. Doing some post hoc analysis uh, versus standard mortality, um, you can see the risk of death at baseline less than 6%, 6 to 20%, 21 to 50%, or greater than 50%, uh, and then all. Generally, TXA uh, was significantly better overall based on your mortality. Looking at just specific for bleeding, again, that risk of death related to bleeding, uh, same categories as well as all, significantly better with TXA. So really pointing to uh, a lot of benefit for this drug. So what does that mean? Uh, and all that post hoc analysis? Well, trans ischemic acid can be administered safely to a wide spectrum of patients with traumatic bleeding and should not be restricted to the most severely injured. And this was a study published in 2000, I'm sorry, 2012, uh, September, that really looked at all of that data from the CRASH-2 trial, did some more data crunching, this post hoc analysis, uh, and really kind of came up that, look, depending on how significant patient is, whether they're minor versus severe, uh, it's safe and it's effective uh, and should be given. So summing it all up, there was a reduction in all-cause mortality, about 14.5% in the TXA group versus the 16% in the placebo group. So this is pretty significant. Bleeding re related mortality was reduced uh, to 4.9% in the TXA group versus 57 in the placebo group. And there was no increase in fatal vaso-occlusive events. Um, so pretty significant uh, data that, in, that came out of this trial.
So what does it cost? That's probably the greatest part. Uh, it's about 100 bucks for the, the bolus. It's about $50 for the bolus, $50 for, uh, for another vial for the drip. Um, some, put some supplies, some saline, uh, some needle syringes, tubing. Um, you're looking around $100, $110. Um, so pretty, uh, pretty cheap. Uh, pretty stable drug, easy to store. Um, you don't need to, any fancy storage requirements. Um, so pretty cheap all over. Now remember those PCs. PSS, uh, sorry, PCCs, the protein uh, prothrombin complex, it costs you know, somewhere between you know a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. Um, a lot of the recombinant factors, uh, so kind of in the same neighborhood. Um, so overall, this is a pretty cheap drug. So, so studies looking at you know, is it cost effective? Well, the answer is very. If you look down here uh, at the bottom. The cost of life year gained of administering TXA is about $48 in Tanzania, $66 in India, and about $64 in the UK. Um, so that's pretty significant. Some extra math. The World Health Organization you know, rule of thumb is the country's average annual income times three. So for the US, that's about $100,000 uh, per quality life year saved. Um, the TXA number needed to treat is less than 100, so you don't need to treat a lot of patients to make this pretty beneficial. Again, we looked at the cost of the bolus plus the uh, drip is about uh, $100, so the cost life, um, cost per life saved, uh, worst case, $10,000. If you look at uh, just giving the bolus alone, it's about $5,000. Uh, the cost per life saved, uh, assuming 20 years, uh, is about 250 if you give the bolus and drip together. And if you give the uh, bolus uh, and drip within the first hour of injury, uh, it's less than $250 as the cost per life per year. So that's pretty significant. So some of the, the criticism of the CRASH-2 trial was, well, they're not looking at the same um, hospital caliber, um, trauma services, um, sophisticated equipment um, that we do in the US. Well, there was a little bit of split out of the hospitals with similar capabilities, uh, Canada, some of the European hospitals, uh, and they compared those same hospitals with the same capabilities as the American uh, Trauma Foundations and Resuscitation of Everett's, and they found that they got the same effects. So really, um, if you took out a lot of the third world hospitals and looked at just um, similar capabilities between the U.S. and those hospitals, there was no difference. Um, the same results were... Uh, occurred. So that leads us to the MATTER study, uh, the military application uh, TXA and trauma emergency resuscitation study uh, was done in Afghanistan and this was being done as I was deployed as well uh, so it was interesting we got to hear bits and pieces of this as it was going on. The MATTER study though was a retrospective observational study so it was really a chart review um, looking at patients. Um, it was set in a Roll 3 Echelon Surgical Hospital in southern Afghanistan. And they really looked at, um, uh, if you kind of get back into some of the study and, and talk to some of the people in country, um, this was a British-run base uh, for the most part. Uh, and at the time, there was U.S. services as well as British services. Patients were coming in with the same injury uh, severity scores. They had the same trauma capabilities. The difference was the British patients were surviving and the American patients were not. So they looked at it as to why. And really what it came down to was the British were carrying TXA. So they looked at you know that uh, and kind of looked back through charts, uh, American charts, the UK charts, um, to get an idea uh, was TXA beneficial. So they essentially looked at TXA versus no TXA. Uh, combat casualties receiving um, blood transfusions, at least uh, one packed unit. Um, they looked at a subgroup analysis of patients that got a massive transfusion. That goes back to the massive transfusion they identified as greater than or equal to 10 units of packed red blood cells. So we're looking at combat casualties that were receiving blood as part of their resuscitative process and those patients that were having massive transfusions as part of their uh, trauma resuscitation. So they looked at 100 and uh, 800, 900, 896 uh, combat casualties, and this included uh, soldiers as well as civilians. 293 received TXA, 
uh, and they were looking at UK as well as US trauma registries. Their protocol was a little bit different. Um, they typically were giving one gram bolus uh, and then repeated that bolus if they thought the patient needed it. Um, so it was a little bit different. There wasn't a strict protocol because um, it wasn't a study at the time. They were just using it uh, based on uh, previous literature. So you can see here, 896 patients, uh, Camp Bastion, uh, in southern Afghanistan, um, and they're looking at those patients that required uh, transfusion. So 293 received TXA, uh, 603 did not, 125 received TXA on a massive transfusion protocol, and 196 did not on a massive transfusion protocol. Their main outcomes they were looking at were mortality at 24 hours, 48 hours, and then at 30 days. They also want to see if the influence of TXA on post-operative coagulopathy uh, and the rate of thromboembolic complications. So they were looking to see if there was an increase in DVT, PE, MI, stroke as well. Here's the data. You can see the age, uh, mostly uh, male, 97%. Um, host nation uh, versus NATO military, you can see you know, who the injuries were, uh, GSW type injuries versus explosive injuries, their severity scores, um, head injury versus chest versus abdomen versus extremity, GCS less than 8, systolic blood pressure is less than 90, 24 hour transfusions of packed red cells, uh, plasma versus platelets versus cryoprecipitate, uh, and you can see overall the TXA versus no TXA, and then looking at the mass transfusion uh, arm as well, uh, as it split out time in the AD, time in the OR, um, body temperatures, PE, DVT, um, are all the factors that they looked at. So some of the results, the TXA group had lower unadjusted mortality than no TXA group, uh, and that's 17.4% versus 23%. 0.9% respectively. So that's pretty significant with a p-value of 0 0.03. Um, so pretty interesting number. Um, and this was despite being more severely injured. So their injury severity score of 25.2 versus 22.5 uh, in the TXA versus the non-TXA arms with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. So pretty significant numbers. Uh, the benefit was greatest in the group of patients who did receive massive transfusions. Uh, so those patients that got a lot of blood products, you know, you see the benefit was 14.4% versus 28.1% uh, with your p-value of 0 0.004. So pretty uh, impressive benefits. TXA was also independently associated with higher survival and less coagulopathy. So looking at some of the... Uh, over all-cause mortality, overall a massive transfusion group within 24 hours. So TXA versus no TXA. Those are the numbers. If you look at this graph, patients with uh, cumulative survival um, over follow-up days, you can see that the TXA arm had a much cumulative, uh, better cumulative survival rate uh, over no TXA. So pretty even numbers, you know, as we kind of go out, um, but initially pretty significant. So they conclude the use of TXA with blood component-based resuscitation following combat injuries results in improved measures of coagulopathy and survival. And that was uh, shown to be most beneficial in the patients re requiring massive transfusion. So significant, you know, effect uh, and benefit of TXA in those patients getting, you know, a lot of blood products. They also concluded that treatment with TXA should be implemented into clinical practice part of a resuscitation strategy following severe wartime injury and hemorrhage. Um, so uh, big time uh, benefit. Um, smaller study than the CRASH-2, um, again, observational study, uh, but significant results nonetheless. Uh, again, uh, not a lot of complications as far as DVT-PE, uh, very similar to the uh, CRASH-2 trial. So we, we sh know that about 41% of patients that, are, that have traumatic bleeding um, are related to cerebral events. Um, so that brings us back, you know, does TXA work? with traumatic brain injury, with cerebral bleeds. 
Well, there was a study done in two, uh, 2012, March, looking at um, Crash 2 data um, and using similar protocols uh, in head injured patients, uh, a randomized placebo controlled uh, study. But it was a relatively small study, and the result of that was that it was essentially a wash in terms of benefit to TBI patients. Uh, but some of the, the um, criticisms of the paper in the study was that it was really relatively small. Uh, limited numbers. So there are other studies underway, uh, which is significant. If you remember, TXA crosses the blood-brain barrier. So um, you would think that uh, decreasing fibrinolysis in, a, in the cerebral hemorrhage patient would be um, beneficial. So that leads us to the CRASH-3 trial, and that's the clinical randomization of an antifibrinolytic and significant head injury. Um, some of that is, is included uh, with the U.S. There's some um, flight programs in Cincinnati uh, that are doing uh, head injury studies. So there's a lot of studies ongoing to see um, is this going to be a benefit. But as of right now, it still sits as a contraindication. Uh, but some of the early data coming out of this is, is uh, quite promising. So summarizing, um, TXA is associated with a 1.5% reduction in a 28-day all-cause mortality in adult trauma patients with signs of bleeding. So those patients with blood pressures less than 90, heart rates greater than 100 or both, and within 8 hours of injury, um, looking at the data. What is critical is the mo most uh, beneficial effect on the overall population. Um, you have an all-cause mortality reduction from 16 to 14.5%. Uh, which is you know, statistically significant. The risk of death from bleeding uh, was reduced from 5.7% to 4.9%. Again, um, pretty significant. TXA signal for benefit was the most uh, in severe shocky group. Um, so those with the systolic blood pressure is less than 75. The 28-day uh, all-cause mortality of 30.6% for the TXA versus 35.1% for the placebo group. Um, so pretty significant effect in those patients that are pretty sick. Uh, TXA had the greatest impact in reduction of death caused by bleeding in the severe shock group. Uh, again, systolic blood pressure is less than 75. 14.9% uh, of the TXA versus uh, the 18.4% for the placebo group. So again, pretty significant. We know that early TXA was associated with the greatest reduction, uh, about 32% reduction in deaths by bleeding. So, um, And that goes from the time of injury. So less than an hour, again, goes back to that golden hour, uh, platinum 10 minutes, you know, think TXA. TXA given between the one hour and three hour mark also had a significant reduction, 4.8% versus 6.1%. Uh, but over three hours, really, there was not a significant increase. In fact, um, there was actually a worsening effect. Um, and some theories about that. One, we know that the um, half-life is about three hours, uh, which may play into it. Um, but more so, as bleeding occurs, again, we talked about all those clotting factors being absorbed, uh, used up to cause uh, clot formation, uh, and if you use all the clotting factors up, again, you're tipped to the uh, fibrinolytic route. Um, there's just nothing you know, left at that point um, to cause um, to the balance to go back towards um, coagulation. So really, at that point, you can block as much fibrinolysis as you want, but there are no clotting factors to create uh, the clotting cascade, um, so it just doesn't work. So keep that in mind. You know, Three hours is the uh, golden rule. We know that transacemic acid reduces mortality in bleeding trauma patients, doesn't increase unwanted clotting, so no increase in, in uh, significant increase in uh, DVT, PE, stroke, or MI. TXA didn't have any impact on team TBI out, uh, outcomes, but uh, again, remember the further studies are underway. Uh, CRASH-3 uh, is the big study, uh, prompted to be as large as the CRASH-2, uh, although we'll see. Transcheme acid is, acid is not expensive uh, and could save hundreds of thousands of lives each year around the world. As a result of that, and looking at the CRASH-2 tr uh, trial data, uh, TXA was added to the World Health Organization list of essential medications in March of 2011. Uh, military using TXA to treat combat casualties, they consider TXA as a uh, class 1A drug um, to be given before fluids.
um, in the military world, uh, there's only so much that one can carry into the um, uh, trauma, or, or I'm sorry, the fighting arena. So medics, you know, often use uh, permissive hypotension, um, small fluid bolses, um, 500 cc's at a time, uh, no less. Um, so the, the, the studies uh, in the literature really has pointed towards the military kind of using uh, TXA as soon as there's any type of uh, hemorrhagic type wound, um, starting TXA first, followed by fluids, you know, for your resuscitations, really to kind of keep that blood pressure around 90 or so. Um, they just don't have a lot to carry when you're on the battlefield. And, um, sometimes it transfers of uh, traumatic patients to a um, significant trauma center with resuscitative efforts, you know, can take hours. Um, so TXA has to be given, you know, as first line, uh, which is um, pretty promising. TXA is being used around uh, the world in many hospitals, and uh, we're just now seeing TXA hitting the EMS world by storm. Um, there are uh, GEMS articles, um, protocols are being created uh, for flight programs, um, New Jersey is using it on the ground, um, so you're starting to see TXA um, hit uh, our literature um, every day, and there are new articles. So again, that leads us to our protocol uh, here at Medivac. So our indications for TXA, um, TXA should be given to patients who are suffering from suspected acute hemorrhagic shock. They have obvious signs of traumatic hemorrhage following 500 to 1,000 cc's of crystalli crystalloid, have vital signs of, with blood pressures less than 90 systolic, and or heart rates greater than 110, or both, should be given less than three hours from time of injury. Uh, again, remember, best to start within the first hour. Um, so that golden hour, uh, think TXA. Our contraindications, if it is over three hours of the time of injury, um, we shouldn't be giving it. Again, the literature shows us that we shouldn't, uh, that there is no benefit. If they have an allergy to TXA, um, now this obviously is, is going to be difficult to determine, uh, especially on scene. Um, but if you have a patient that can tell you, look, I got it you know, last time I was shot, um, then probably not a medication that they should be getting. Isolated head injuries. Um, again, remember the data doesn't support uh, in TBI. Um, hopefully that will change, uh, but as of right now, isolated head injuries, uh, we're avoiding TXA. If a patient has a known history of thromboembolic disease, they have a PE, uh, history, if they have a DVT history, if they have a green filled filter. Um, so if you can, ask those questions. And pay, this is really for adult patients, um, so those, you know, uh, 15 years and older. Administering TXA uh, can be given peripherally, can be given centrally, or even through an IO. Um, so it can really be given um, any way that we typically get uh, fluids and meds into a patient. Dosing is uh, one gram over 10 minutes as an IV push, followed by one gram uh, over eight hours as an infusion. So procedure. First, we want to identify patients uh, who are actively hemorrhaging or in hemorrhagic shock or at high potential for high hemorrhagic shock. Um, so those patients uh, with you know, penetrating injuries, uh, blunt injuries with severe mechanism uh, that might be hypotensive. Uh, think about those patients. Um, quickly review the clinical criteria and indications. Make sure there are no contraindications uh, by reviewing your TXA checklist. If TXA is clinically appropriate, prepare the medication for Im immediate administration. You're going to mix one gram of TXA, about 10 cc's, and 50 cc's of a normal saline bag. And you're going to give that medication over 10 minutes via gravity. After that's done, you're going to prepare uh, the TXA infusion. So you're going to mix one gram of TXA and about 250 cc's of normal saline. Low to 60 cc syringe and begin the infusion at 31 cc's an hour. You're going to pl then place the TXA bracelet on the patient, uh, indicating that they received the medication. And then once you get to the designated trauma center, whether that's our center uh, or one of the others, you're going to report that the TXA was given the time the medication was given, and the dose that was given. 
You're going to speak directly with the lead provider involved in the resuscitation. Confirm via feedback, whether that's verbal, uh, written. If you have to sign off, that's fine. Uh, the thing that the team understood that TXA was administered. If there are any issues, um, please document that as well. You're then going to complete a special report to indicate the medication was given. Those reports then were re reviewed by the Quality Council as well as uh, myself and Dr. McCarthy. And again, another place if you have any issues, there was a, a trauma program, a surgeon or so that uh, had any reservations about the fact that TXA was given, anything like that, please report that as well um, so that we can address those with the trauma centers. And obviously politely remind them this is our protocol, this is kind of how we're handling things, and uh, Dr. McCarthy and I will make sure that uh, we ha acknowledge uh, and confirm any uh, issues with other trauma centers. So how much will TXA help? Well, I think this study in, in uh, 2012 summed it all up. 300 I'm sorry, 3,996 deaths a year in the U.S. could be avoided if TXA was routinely given in less than an hour, or 3,497 if given less than three hours. I think that sums it up. Um, we know that the drug works. We know that it is cost-effective. We know that it's easy to store, uh, very little fuss and muss, and we know that the literature and data supports uh, that we'll be saving lives with this drug. So. That leads us to, if there are any questions, um, please refer them to myself or Dr. McCarthy. Um, you know, send us an email. Uh, call us uh, directly. Uh, we'll be happy to kind of lead you towards uh, the answer. Um, and I would suggest, you know, if you have some time, you know, look up the Crash 2 study. Look up the Matter study. Um, read them. Uh, kind of get an idea about um, the, the literatures out there. And as we look towards the future, the CRASH-3 study uh, and other studies that are out there on head injuries, you know, I hope that uh, we do see the benefit that we think we will um, and to lead us to alter our protocols uh, and make a difference in our patients. So again, I thank you for taking the time uh, to look through this education uh, piece on TXA. And uh, I hope that uh, you have significant uh, benefit with your trauma patients. Um, and please, if you have uh, stories, um, a patient that was hypotensive and, and uh, improved after your TXA, please pass those along as well. Um, we'd love to kind of look at those, those uh, patients, um, study their injuries, uh, understand their injuries, and see where the uh, benefit of the TXA was. So again, I thank you uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.